all this other sort of stuff. But you know, after about a, a week of doing it regularly, it becomes, it, it sort of doing it then becomes the routine. And then you are able to, you know, it, it's, it's harder to kind of pick it up again and restart. But once it's rolling, um, a good um, metaphor um, that um, uh, Beth Globally uses is the idea of tapping the tire. Have you ever rolled a tire along, right? The tire's rolling along. Um, originally, getting the tire up is difficult, right? Um, but once you've got along, as long as you kind of come along and you tap the tire, right, that tire keeps rolling along and it rolling along and rolling along. And all you, and then for you, you're just walking along and you tap the tire. And it just becomes part of the, the routine. So you want to think about um, just sort of letting something be part of your routine enough that you're able just to easily without a lot of you know having to get stuff out you can just kind of regularly tap the tire and if in order to tap the tire you have to like the journals over there in that closet and the pencils over there you know it makes it harder to tap the tire but you can you can make it um just kind of get the logistics taken care of and um i can have the, so um heather yeah let, let's uh I wanted to tell you yesterday, but um, so I don't know if you remember a while back, you kind of showed me how to draw a butterfly and you mentioned that they weren't doing well. And so um, during one of the journal shares, I journal shared about the butterflies really for the express purpose that I wanted people to get the message out that the monarchs aren't doing well. And yeah. then I also used that picture as like, probably not the right way to say it, but like advertisement. So every Facebook page I could legitimately put that picture on. I put the picture and I also put a link that there was a talk about how to help the monarch butterflies. And so I was going to give you feedback on that, that um, in Ivea's pencil miles, I was really tickled because someone didn't remember that I did anything, but just fine. That's great. Um, but they said, did you go to the monarch butterfly talk? And I thought, yay, okay, so somebody went. So, so I thought that was a real, a real um, plus. And then the other thing that I did was uh, Roseanne Hansen, um, she does these uh, safaris. And so I had seen a um, Yosemite, there was a park ranger who did like, he called it a micro safari and it was a little YouTube thing where he really just showed all the bugs that went, that, you know, were active on milkweed. And so I got in contact with her and I said, um, what do you think about doing a micro safari on the, um, on milkweed for the butterflies? And, um, and she's doing it. And so in, I think not this weekend, but next weekend, she'll have a, a micro safari. So I was really pleased that, you know, just a little bit of um, activism got like a um, big results. Yeah. That's, that is really, really cool. Um, if you have any um, links to that that you can put in the, the chat, that is, you're really making this connection between stewardship and this, this journaling. The sort of storytelling we're doing is very powerful to, to get people connected with us. That's exciting. Well done. And, and the butterflies also really appreciate it. Well, um, another thing that I put in the, um, the Facebook thing today was I asked people, does anybody do um, citizen science? And I asked, does anyone nature journal on that? So that was kind of a, something I haven't explored, but I, I thought would be an interesting thing to look into. What is citizen science? Um, so what I know about it as is that um, there's different groups, the whole idea and um, I'll put a link if I can find it. Our, our um, Natural History Museum had a whole exhibit on this, but it's the idea that citizens, that, that people, people can help out and do um, collect data for science. And so that could be an online thing, as in um, one of the things that I'm involved in is the burrowing owls for the zoo. The uh, zoo helps to breed and release and protect the habitat of 
um, the native burrowing owls. And so they have cameras on those burrowing owl nests. And so you look at the pictures and evaluate, are they eating, are there chicks, are there predators, are they running, are they sit so that the scientists have data. And the idea is the that people can just look at these pictures and quickly go through them. And it's a big help to, um, to research and conservation. Yeah, and there's all sorts of, of, uh, uh, of, of different, oh, hold on, I need to kind of jump over to the uh, waiting room and um, deactivate the waiting room so that everybody who kind of joins this meeting can automatically slip in. There we go. Um, yeah, so the different sorts of, of citizen science projects on, on different things. And the, the general idea is that if you get somebody who understands how to set up a scientific research project um, to do the initial setup, a lot of the observation part can be done just like by people like you and me with in some specific parameters in a way of reporting that data. And then the scientists get millions of eyes by crowdsourcing that out to just naturalists like us. And so there are projects that are kind of looking at phenology, like when things are blooming, when birds arrive and all these sorts of things, counting butterflies. Um, um, the eBird is a good example of it. Uh, it's this little app there where people record, like I went to this place, I saw these birds today. I went to this place, I saw these birds in this other place. And then all of that goes into a central database and then we get real time information about what the bird populations are in different locations all across the United States. And um, it is, it really gives us a much more accurate and powerful picture um, because there's no way that a scientist could get um, 100,000 volunteers coordinated to collect, you know, bird presence absence data. And, but people will do that on their own um, in these citizen science projects. Um, um, Avea is also doing a lot of stuff with uh, kind of connecting nature journaling with um, nature stewardship. And um, uh, 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 Ived, would you be willing to give us a kind of a little bit of uh, an update on, on your thinking about how you use, um, how you use uh, nature journaling in the context of nature stewardship? Um, actually, just wrote down a ton of ideas I have about this because I'll be making some, a video soon about something related to this. Um, and that's that um, it's important, I think, to write down the work that you do. Um, when you're like, I personally, I do, I'm part of something called the Presidio Habitat Stewards, um, where when it's not COVID, we go out um, in volunteer crews a few times a week. Um, and you're welcome to go as little or as much as you can. I go on Wednesdays usually. Um, and we go to different sites in the Presidio to usually to pull up um, plants that kind of set the ecosystem off balance, invasive ones. Um, but we also plant out areas um, with, with native ones that we grow in our nursery and sometimes pick up trash, a, a ton of different things. And so I think it's important to be able to draw our sites um, and to write down what we do that day to show the tools that we use, the plants that we focus on. So like, for example, this, this is my hope, I'm going to be well, okay, before the thing began, I had just begun stewarding an individual site called Battery East. I recently, as in this week, got news from my supervisor that he's trying to get the green light to have individual stewards come back since we still can't have groups. And he's like, would you like to go back to Battery East? I'm like, yes, yes, I've been waiting. So, um, so like drawing out where the, um, the populations are of things that I'm pulling out, drawing where some of the more rare, um, yeah, I'm trying to find my map here. Some of the more rare things like the Franciscan Manzanita clones that we're trying to grow since there's only one living species member left of this in the world. Um, so we're growing clones. Um, writing down where I have to pull things out, um, keeping track of how that changes over time. Um, or like, for example, if I see something rare, like even though there's just stick figures, and as I wrote here, if you have to choose between stick figures and really complicated drawings, choose the stick figures and get as much info as you can. On this particular day, I saw that a snake. really good what you just said. Say that again. That was brilliant. Oh, thanks. Um, I said, if you have to choose between stick figures and really complicated drawings, choose the stick figures because you'll get down more information that way. And like um, 
and this particular thing, trying to journal in the field, doing field work journaling, it's going to teach you the value of quick note sketching and not worrying about pretty pictures and just trying to get raw data down as much as possible. This is a great area to use numbers in um, because you can write down things like how many volunteers showed up that day, how many bags of weeds got pulled, or like uh, you can even estimate like what the what the coverage is like, oh, there's 100% ground cover here of um, Delaria odorata versus, you know, maybe you get 5% coyote brush and you're trying to, to change that. So it, it, every single concept we've ever talked about in nature journaling gets combined when you're doing field work. So like, for example, I sketched um, a quick little snake and wrote down where I saw it with my little stick figure because we don't get very many snakes in the Presidio. And I wanted to note down where it was and what plant it was hiding underneath. Um, and then also I tried to draw like how I'm noticing that the, um, the Delaria odorata or the Cape Ivy comes back, that these nondescript little sticks that seem like they're just innocently sitting there are actually how they're coming back and how they're able to grow from one little inch to a foot in a month if they are leaving even one. We are losing your the fish. So we, we, writing we, down all of that. We didn't get the end of that sentence about the, the, you, the, the stick was growing. Oh, right. Nondescript, um, nondescript little stick here that everybody assumes is just minding its own business, that this is how it comes back. This is how it comes back. Um, and so like maybe another day I'm at Chrissy Field. So I draw what the marsh looks like from above and I draw maybe where the dunes are and where we work. For me, this is also personal because it's my first memory of going to Chrissy Field. Or actually, this was my second one. My first was over here in 1999. I was 13. It was pouring down rain and I knew I'd found my calling. And then um, this is an area that we worked in so it's so that people can understand like you hear, oh, we went to the dune scrubs and we pulled up, um, you know, um, sour grass. People can hear that, but it's better like we learned in nature journaling if you can see it. So I might draw a little landscape people of where we were that day. Or maybe I draw that we were on the coast and I want to draw exactly where in the marsh we were picking up the trash. And of course the weird things that we find like a random spatula. Um, on another day with Amy, I happened to see a motorcycle helmet. So I drew that as well. Um, and by the way, if I'm talking too much, please stop me at any no, no, time. No, no, this, is, this is good. Maybe a different environment in the Presidio because the Presidio has got a lot of little, I draw a map so that that way I'll remember where exactly it is. And that way, if somebody is careful enough with Google Maps, they can say, oh, I want to go to Eastern Tributary. I look for a street called Rodriguez and the Paul Goodfield here in the Presidio, I can go there. Um, this is what it looks like now. In an, you know a few years, it's going to look different. So I'm glad I drew it now so we can see progress. Mm -hmm. um, this one right here might be a Cape Ivy, except this one's super duper anemic, which I wish I'd written this down in my notes, but this is more of a like illustrative piece that's different from actual notes. And then maybe this is another one. And I drew this to remind people that, hey, when they're little, they're easier to pull out. So mm. I don't know if, if any of this is making sense. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm writing a script for the video and I'll be able to share that. Um, oh, that's gonna be really fun. Why it's important. That's really fun. Thank, uh. thank you. And, I'll show you guys more things later. I, I have a garden journal that explains a lot more about the unpretty pictures. I posted some of those up recently, but just keeping the raw notes. Okay, one more thing. Don't worry about the pretty pictures and don't feel badly if you can't write down everything because suppose that in about, I don't know, maybe a month, you only write down six pages worth of information about your work site. That is six pages more information than you would have had if you didn't open your book. Right. Meaning that if you look back a year from now, and you see what's, maybe you don't know what happened in July, but you know that on August 8th, the conditions were like this and you can compare it. Every little bit of information that you write down in any capacity helps. And that means that you get better at your work. It means that as you go into the future, that you have an idea of where you've been. If somebody wants to duplicate how you do things, then they can see how you did it because you wrote down your, your methods and you can keep track about how you yourself are changing the field. And then you can know if you're changing it for the better or if you need to do it in a different way. And thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Ideas worth spreading. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for, for, for sharing that. Um, so what we're seeing here is that yeah, the, the nature journaling, it's, it's a real tool of real science. 
Um, and when we're teaching students how to do that, we're putting that same tool in their hands. Um, really neat use of, you know, close-ups and maps and diagrams. Um, you're pulling together all these different aspects, not because it's some aesthetic thing, but because it's useful. And um, one of the, the big strategies that um, I think that we can all have is to, to think about giving our students a suite of tricks like this. Um, so if you weren't able, if you, if like making maps wasn't on your radar, you wouldn't be making maps. And the data that is most easily recorded that way would not be anywhere in your, um, in your, in your notes. Um, it's sort of the, the old saying is like, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Um, but if you have, you know, these, 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 these lists and measurements and you've got the, um, the, the maps and the little landscapitos and the close-up of the roots of the poison hemlock and all these different ways that you can go at something, you, act, you have a smorgasbord of tools. So one of the things that I, 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 I'm now really thinking really deliberately about is that in teaching nature journaling, how in, in each of the areas, so in, um, in words and in pictures and in numbers, how can we e help equip students with a bunch of strategies in each one of those for better note taking? And the result is sort of pages that, that look like what you've got going on there. Um, the, for, so something that I think might be kind of, is, is a useful thing to do is every once in a while for yourself to sit down and make a list of how many strategies you currently have in your quiver for approaches to um, visual thinking. You know, for instance, an example of that is you can make a map, right? Um, and, and then you can do the same thing with words, the same thing with numbers. So that actually might be a really useful thing for us to do right now. Um, hold on, I'm gonna go grab that notepad over there. So why don't, why don't we just, um, let's just start a, let, let's do this today with either um, words or pictures or numbers and try to come up with the, um, a bullet point list of the strategies um, that we, that we, that we have in our quivers. Cause some of these things, you know, once somebody points it out to you, like, like, oh, you can do that. Then you start doing that. Um, so which you want to do somebody um, make a comment into the chat or um, on air here. Um, should we do the words, the pictures or the numbers today? Numbers, numbers. It is two votes for numbers. Um, oh, hey, Melinda, I didn't know that you were online here. Um, good to see you. Um, and um, so let's just start by everybody um, on your own piece of paper. We're going to take one minute and try to write down a little list of how many strategies you can come up with of using quantification and numbers, um, as many things as you can. You're ready? And also, if you're watching this video at home, you do it too. Ready? On your mark, get set, and go.
15 more seconds. All right, the way it's going to go is like this. Um, you are, you can unmute yourself if you want to verbally share. Um, and um, what you're going to do is pick two of the things that are on your list and you'll mention those. And um, the, uh, and then um, we'll, we might kind of unpack what we mean by those a little bit, and then we'll get two more from another person or two more from another person. If you want to only want to share one, if somebody's already said one of your other ones, it's going to be okay. And then as people mention things um, that are not on your list, you want to add that to your list, all right? So we're kind of crowdsourcing quantification here. Um, anybody want to go first? All right, um, let's, let's start with uh, Julie. Uh, I, I put date and time uh, for numbers, and I hadn't thought about that before we did this exercise, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's, it's, it's a way of describing something with numbers, so that's my contribution. Yeah, that, that's sort of, you know, uh, if you date stamp a photograph and geo-reference it, it becomes data. And the same is true with a journal page. You date stamp and geo-reference your, 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 your journal page. That's, that's great. You know, and um, I didn't have date on my list. So I'm mm -hmm. adding date to my list. Very, very, very important. Cool. Um, uh, who, uh, who's up next? What else can we add? Melinda. Um, let's see. How about if I pick um, angles is one and um, air quality <laughs> is another. I've been tracking air quality because of all the smoke. So just getting a um, index, the air quality index, and then putting that on my journal pages the la in the last week. Um, because who knows? Uh, that you might be able to, to estimate that yourself or are you kind of getting that off of the air quality? Website? I do. I do two readings because I don't trust the air quality um, index. I've tried different websites and I put the number down, but I also put um, a description of what's what I see. So I might say smoky or I smell the smoke or I don't smell smoke. Um, um, and I kind of put that in with my weather, you know, so it might be foggy and hazy and smoky. So just kind of combine that in. So those are words, but um, the way to quantify it is with the numbers. I. I'd like to get a weather station for my property because I want to know, you know, exactly what's happening in my yard. And um, Wonderground is a really great place where I get all my um, weather information because there is a weather station that's about a mile away from me. And that's much closer than, um, I'm in a rural area. So when I go with a weather station that's in the town of Castroville, it's actually much farther away than where I'm at. And we have lots of microclimates. So, I think getting a weather station for your school is a really great idea, um, whether it's an electronic station or just a thermometer that they can measure, um, right? Learning how to read a dial or learning how to read um, a rain gauge. Um, so yeah, that's all numbers. So, um, and angles was the other one. Um, I just um, have been measuring angles of flowers. I noticed um, the nasturtium flowers. I don't know if you know what nasturtiums are, but I saw the seed pods all over the ground and the stems got all twisty. So I was looking at the angles. I didn't measure those this time because they were all curly. But I noticed that when they're fresh, they're standing straight up and then they start to bend and curl and do these twisty things. So I've got a whole page full. I got to go back and look at it and maybe measure oh, some God. angles. So yeah, uh, angles. I think. How, how are you measuring the angles? So um, measuring the angles. So with aloe flowers, flower spikes, I, I notice they go, they're up, pointed up when they're buds, and then they start to point downwards and when they open. So I'll just take a protractor and put it right next to it and estimate it. Actually, if I don't have a protractor, I know that um, this perpendicular is 90 degrees. 
so I might estimate it is about 45 or 30. So, you know, teaching your students about estimating, right? Like it doesn't have to be 31 degrees. Like I don't have to have that precision because it's not a science experiment, but it's important for me to know that it's pointing kind of upwards and not all the way out to the side. So I might just pick a number and I know that half of this is 45 and maybe I want to, you know, I can visualize what that looks like. So that might just be a practice in incorporating how do I see angles in the world and how can I estimate it? And then if you have a protractor, you know, just a thin one, or even the one from your um, handout that you can get on the website, you know, just cut that out and have it in your nature journal. You can use that to kind of estimate the angle of something. So the angle of flower growth, maybe the angle of um, a hillside. Yeah, see Jack's holding it up now. That's, I have that in my book too. Um, so I think angles are something that we don't think about a lot with numbers, so that, um, but I've been really trying to, to incorporate that more. Um, so something I, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, after this talk, uh, Melinda, send me your address. I wanna send you okay. a toy. <gasps> oh, cool! This is a, this is a goniometer. I was looking up one of those. Physiotherapists use them to measure the amount of movement you have in a joint after an injury. And you can, um, I've been, uh, you can also use this to, to look at the, it's, it's transparent. So if you, you have a, um, uh, a, a little branch coming off of a plant yes. like this, you can hold it up and look through it and be able to measure easier if you have two hands, um, measure that angle. And then you read it off of this thing very, very precisely. Um, I've also figured out ways of being able that you can actually measure sun angle with your goniometer. Um, and um, so it's, kind of, it's a fun tool. It also can straighten out just to a longer ruler, um, but you can also use it to uh, um, do a, a I've got, I've got a few of them. If there's somebody who's on this call that you need your own goniometer, shoot me an email and I will uh, um, get um, uh, get one of those in the mail to you. I've got a very a handy few, um, sitting around in my 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 studio here that I can get into the hands of nature journaling educators such as yourselves. Thank you. All right. Um. Yeah, Heather. So one of um, Ivea and I talked for a while about not everyone has access to, to nature. And so I think a lot of people assume, yes, there's a park nearby or that you can walk somewhere or that there's a plant in the house. Um, and that isn't always the case, which kind of got me really thinking, what are things that everyone has? What are things that everyone um, can see. And so part of that got me thinking to the sky. And so one of the things that I think of when I think of nature is, or numbers, is that you can know how far something is. So in terms of air quality, um, uh, I used to, uh, well, I do volunteer at the, um, at the aquarium. And part of my job used to be as the, um, I would go out to the pier and take the weather readings part of the weather readings was there were certain points and you knew how far those points were and you would say, can you see that? So even today, if, if I'm out and I'm, and I'm looking around, I would um, look, can I see the islands? Can I see how much can I see, you know, this building versus that building? And if you kind of have a judge, so like there's some islands off the coast and I know it's 13 miles. If, if I can see that, I know I have 13 mile visibility. And you can also turn this into nighttime. So you can, how much of the star, so that takes you into light pollution. Um, and that takes you at, you know, can I see this star versus that star? And that's something you can go look at every day. Uh, yes, I could see the summer triangle, but it couldn't see all of, you know, the swan um, or um, percent, uh, so, so that's one thing. And then another thing in terms of what is something everybody has, everybody has clouds. And so um, you can look at percent cover. Um, so uh, that's, that was one of my jobs going out was to go out, look up and, 
how much and they had a graph of you know this this much versus that much versus so what's the percent cover of of cloud cover for the day it would be fun to make a little chart um, recording the magnitude of um, of of stars of different brightness and so that you know you could um, you could actually in your notes say you know like you know um, uh, tonight I'm seeing you know uh, ones and twos um, That's a great idea. and uh, that might be a you know to, to figure out with you know Vega Altair and Deneb um, you know what is what is what is your magnitude um, and then when you get down to um, other stars uh, in those uh, in those those constellations um, some some specific ones to target that are different magnitudes that are um, for in the northern hemisphere we might want to consider some of the stuff around the circumpolar constellations um, so maybe you know which stars in the Big Dipper can you see which stars in the Little Dipper which gets more um, faint can you see because those those um, if you did stuff that with circumpolar constellations you would have something if you're in the northern hemisphere uh, something in your face all the time and if you are in the southern hemisphere just to kind of get a similar chart of um, of, of, of what are the magnitudes of a few of the common circumpolar constellations down there that's cool I like that um, also I like the idea of from whatever observation post you regularly take up just getting out some maps and measuring distances, you know, as the crow flies to different spots um, that are far away from you. That's neat. Um, I, I like this. This is see, this is this is cool because like, I, I had some stuff on my list, and there's so much stuff coming in that we can quantify that was not on my list. And um, let's let's keep this energy going. What else do we have? What else can we? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Miriam, uh, Miriam um, uh, Morel. Uh, raised her hand. Uh, let's hear from her about. Yeah, so um, I like to track wind speed and wind direction, and not only um, what you can get on websites, which is helpful for those people that can't get out and about, but um, there are some great tools that can range in cost. But um, the Buford scale, uh, which has uh, kind of a breakdown on um, just some of the visual cues you can see on um, leaves rustling versus branches blowing. And you can see them uh, in lots of different places. You can see them on grasses. Um, I think it's also helpful to look at the difference of prevailing winds, that like common typical winds versus storm winds. Um, maybe looking to see if the landscape or trees have formed because of regular ongoing wind and kind of measuring where you're seeing that impact. Uh, versus storm winds where you might see more broken branches and things coming down, but you can kind of count not only um, where you're seeing those, but there are ways to add the um, miles per hour and direction to that. That's good. Yeah, the, um, th thank you. That's, that's a really good idea. The, the uh, uh, Admiral Buford um, is famous for having made this chart that helps you look at how the, the size of the white craps on water and convert that into the speed of the wind in, in knots. And um, so that the ships could set their sails appropriately. And that has been modified for stuff on land so that people can um, estimate wind speed by looking at whether is a leaf moving, is a small twig moving, is a branch moving, is the whole tree swing. Each one of those correlates to different wind speeds. And you can do that in uh, knots or uh, miles per hour or kilometers per hour. Um, in the quantification handout that I have in um, as a free download on my website, there's a little Buford wind scale. Um, and mine only goes up to eight. The full scale, I think, goes to 12. Um, but by that point, you know, trees are being uprooted and tossed around. And you probably shouldn't be out nature journaling. Um, so I stopped mine at when you got to gale force winds as a point where you probably, it's now very difficult to, to be nature journaling. Um, but that's a, that's a, is a useful way of, of quantifying those things. What else do we have? I like that. Thank you for bringing up the wind. Yeah, this is 
Mary. Hi, I think it's a chicken baby. Mary, we're having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay. I'm using a, a microphone because I've got a deaf ear, so I have, to have a little trouble hearing otherwise. Um, I, I think of uh, counting just without using uh, formal measurement devices because I'm always out and suddenly I want to know how long something's taking or how far it is. So just getting people used to making do with what you have, pacing things off. Uh, I know you have some things where you measure distance of your hand and biometrics, I guess is that the term. Yeah. But, but uh, counting especially because I um, had seen a grebe on a, a little pond at, on the Duke uh, campus and uh, they kept disappearing. I was thinking they were drowning. I realized they do come up and I became curious how long they stay under. And I ended up counting, and I don't know if this is accurate in general, but it seemed like about 20 seconds. Uh, but if you keep doing this, you'd probably get that little, I guess it ends up being a histogram of the pattern. And uh, uh, after a while, you kind of get an idea of the, the maximum capability for them to stay under, or at least have motivation to stay under, <laughs> if there's something to catch or not. So any, anyway, kind of the things where you can't haul around everything to measure everything and some make do since, as uh, someone pointed out, this isn't a scientific experiment. And that's it. Oh, that, that, that's very helpful. So, so Mary is pointing out that um, <clears throat> if you can count things, count things. Count things, right? And because you, you look through countless... <laughs> Countless uh, ancient, uh, you know, articles and texts and things, the sky was filled with countless birds. Well, how many is countless? So just saying countless um, just means you didn't count them. Um, there's a lot of stuff, you know, that you actually can count. So Mary's saying it goes down. She's going to start looking at her watch, counting or counting the seconds. Um, when I was a Boy Scout, we used to do this thing where everybody would close their eyes and somebody would look at a clock and everybody with their eyes would have their eyes closed and you would, be, everybody would be sitting down. Um, actually, we had our, our, our neckerchiefs over our eyes as blindfolds, which made it more fun. And you, what you tried to do is to estimate exactly when it was one minute. And when it was one minute, then you'd stand up and you try to see who is the closest to that. Um, and so we spent time kind of looking at clocks and just trying to like with a sort of physical metronome in our body kind of get a sense of what a second feels like because otherwise you're going like oh a second's like that like, no it's not um and so that then when the bird goes down and you start counting your seconds you are you're able to do something that will help you be able to estimate the time more accurately you also can have a watch with a uh, a, a second hand, but but you can you can sit down, you can watch a clock, and try to just get your hand to beat out and feel it in your body what those pulses of a second feel like, and then when you're out in the field, you can do the same thing, and that is a really fun way to kind of internalize the feeling of of what a second feels like, and then when you're estimating seconds, you're going to be a lot more accurate. And then you stand up at the right point. That's pretty cool. You get 15 points for your patrol. It was great. Um, so, um, yeah, timing things. That's, that's really important. And, and where you can count things, really count things. Um, what else do we have here? What else do we have going on here? Hey, John, I can talk, yeah. Yes, please. Um, so one of the things that, um, like Miriam, I'm also very interested in the wind speed. So that's living in London. You've been to London. It's it's extremely windy, and it's it's been. Um, it's about. Uh, sorry, but yes. it's thirty-eight. Uh, yeah, last few days it's been wind uh, thirty-eight kilometers per hour all throughout the day. So yeah, so it's been extremely windy. So. I was thinking of uh, getting something for outside my apartment. I, I don't have a private garden, so where I can actually measure. Um, but so I'm looking for some ideas from the group here. Um, the other thing that I measure uh, is the sunrise and the sunset. And that's um, 
that's that's an idea from Melinda's classes and also from the solstice exercise that we did. Um, so as we are tracking and we are also looking forward for the equinox event and see how that the track changes. So yeah, I, yeah. I cannot wait for this equinox. That's gonna be really fun. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, an another fun thing to do is to draw in the phase of the moon that you're currently seeing. Um, <clears throat> just as a, just to kind of keep you tracking the, the all things celestial. Um, mm. But I, I like that. So sunrise, sunset, um, you know, the nature journaler, Claire Walker Leslie, uh, she's always tracking those same things too. Um, when is the sunrise? When is the sunset? And um, where you where you are in sort of the the day length um, changes that has huge implications for um, for the way that the plants and the animals are behaving and interacting. Um, and if you're recording that, then you are at least making sure that you notice those things. Um, I'm going to run over to my shelf here and grab a tool off of it. The box of geek stuff. Um, so uh, something that uh, um, this is a cool little gizmo. Um, this is a SkyMate. And what it is, is a, you turn it on and there's a little uh, propeller that blows around there and it gives you very accurate wind speeds. And you can set that to average, you know, what get the, the highest wind speed, you can set it to kind of average over different periods of time. Um, and it does a few other sort of basic meteorological measurements. Um, so this is, um, if you are kind of considering um, a tech solution to it, um, this is kind of a, this is a fun one, uh, a, a fun one to have. Um, so, um, what are those glasses for? Oh, this, 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 this is, that's just another part of my nerd gear. Um, I went out with some Lichen Society people. And when you are out with the Lichen Society people, everybody's doing this. Right. And so whenever they, they, they look up at you, um, they, <laughs> you see these, 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 these big eyes. And um, because they're, they're always like down on the rock looking at it this close. And then they forget that they're wearing this. And so they're looking at you and kind of just telling, talking to you very excitedly about these lichens. They're just such a, such a wonderful, joyful crew of, of, of people. But it is, it, this is just kind of uh, when we're geeking out on the small. These are made for uh, jewelers. And um, they will put these on to do really fine stuff. And it's got the extra little magnifier that you can, you can bring down. Um, so it's also, you know, it's a kind of... Um, is steampunk chic. Um, What's it called? Um, I, 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 I think it's a jeweler's magnifier head geek piece thing type. I don't know. I don't know. What is it's the called. word geek in there? I, it's got to be. It, it is. It just you got you got to embrace your inner nature nature geek and and just go for it. And once you do, you know you're thinking like like if I wear that. Is not going to be cool. And then you go like, I'm okay with that. And then you're like, all right, game on. All right, let's, let's check that out. So that, that's, 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 is, is big fun. And John, what about the wind direction? How do you measure that? Oh, wind direction. So that's, that's a, now, now, um, um, Melinda, was it yeah. you or Avea who was really yeah. good? Yeah, I did a wind direction thing with my neighbor's flag. Oh wait, Avea might have done one too. I I've seen a couple of people. Dur dur during the storm, who was it who was looking at wind direction as the storm was moving around? Yes. That was, that was you? 
Yes, I was. Um, one second, where's my, my notes? I have them right here. Okay, sorry, too many notebooks. Um, yes, right here. Um, because I'd been reading this really fun book here or something like it by this lovely guy, Tristan Gooley, called The Lost Art of Reading Nature Signs. And he's got this wonderful thing in there about, um, about yeah, winds, local winds, um, how to like measure um, weather winds, that kind of thing. And something about um, keeping the wind at your back and then measuring whether or not the up the clouds are going in the same direction. Um, so I was standing with the wind at my back and realized that the wind was blowing to the west at one point, but that the clouds were moving north at this exact second. Um, and so then I was trying to figure out, is it go, are the clouds going left to right? And he says, left to right, not quite right. So that means that maybe fouler weather is coming. It was the middle of a lightning storm, so I wasn't terribly surprised. Um, and then um, I noticed that the wind shifted to the north. I think that that might have been about 7.08 because it was between my 7.08 and 7.10 notes because I was writing the times for this. Um, oh, the name of the book, and I'll write this in the chat in a second. Oh, somebody did. It's The Lost Art of Reading Nature Science by Tristan Gooley. He's got a ton of books. I have a shelf I'll show you someday. And um, then, um, yeah, and then I was writing down when exactly I saw the lightning strikes to see if it corresponded with the wind shifting and to see if it corresponded with the clouds shifting. And then wondering if as the direction of the winds and clouds shifted, would the direction that the lightning was striking shift as well. Also, out of curiosity, started writing down um, the temperature and humidity because I was wondering if that could be tracked to when the lightning was showing up as well, just for funsies. Did that answer the question? Oh, it did so so well. And I love this thing. You're thinking about the wind at your back. And then I've never thought about looking at the what's going on with the, the high elevation um, light as, as well. That's, that's some next level stuff. That's a, that's, I got to check out that book. That sounds really, really cool. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll check that out. Um, uh, these are, um, so we've got a couple of books being, being held up here. Um, there's a lot of glare. The, uh, a there walker's guide to outdoor clues and signs. It's by the same author. He's a great author. Outdoor clues and signs. And Curious Naturalist. Oh, we're just talking about Claire Walker Leslie. Curious Nature Guide. Very cool. Yeah. So terrific stuff out of, out of this author. She's one of the real thought leaders in nature journaling. Um, Ivea, your book was called what? It was called The Lost Art of Reading Nature's Signs. Art of Reading Nature's Signs. And there was a specific part in there, I actually bookmarked it, where they talk about the higher and the lower winds um, as a way of tracking the um, weather cells and, and how the, like, the high and low pressure zones. So it's about 100 pages in. They talk about weather winds and, um, and yeah, the, the three points about like, you know, staying attuned to the wind direction, left to right, not quite right because warm weather, warm air might be on the way. It goes into it and it's, I was more studying it just to see if, if what I noticed was matching what the book noticed just to test it, <laughs> just for fun. But it, at least it gives you a fun idea of how to explore this stuff. Yeah. There's, uh, if you're in, living in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a wonderful book by uh, Harold Gilliam um, on weather of the San Francisco Bay Area. It is part of the University of California's um, uh, 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 nature guide series and um, he, he this what's what's neat in it is that it was written a long time ago uh, maybe now be out of 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 print um, but uh, so he's, he's also talking about you're standing here so as the storm cell is moving towards you when it first gets to you the, 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 the wind will be co coming one direction to you. And you imagine as that storm cell moves on, the wind direction changes as that same storm cell moves on. And so what, what he does is then takes that and says, if you're standing in the middle of San Francisco and you smell um, petroleum, 
it's then going to be that the wind is coming from this direction because that's been blown from these refineries. But if you smell baking bread, it's coming from this location. And if you smell, so he's actually using smells to, that you, that he'd be out there sniffing the air to get the wind direction. And it's just, that's some, that's, that's some cool stuff there. That's. All right, what was that one called? The, 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 um, uh, it, it was UC Press series, um, and, and, and I don't think like we ha don't have like the bed breaking, bed, bread baking zone in San Francisco anymore. Um, so I don't. I think the system is now kind of broken down because businesses have now moved to other places. Um, but you know, there's certain there are certain places like if you can smell chocolate, it's coming from this direction. If you can smell bread, it's coming from this direction. And so um, it might be interesting to, for us to try to pay attention to, are there any smells um, uh, either, you know, light in, in industrial um, processes in the area that, where you have, or like, can you, if you can smell the ocean, then it's coming from this direction. Um, Gerald can, Gailey, can weather I, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you, Brian. Can I add, add something to that, Jack? Well, I was actually, I wanted to actually intentionally call on you next because oh. you had done some really cool stuff with, um, with, with wind direction and yeah. also it might be neat to tie, to share with folks again. I know you, you shared it in a future, in a previous class, but the observations that you made about the electric storm and how you were quantifying that, yeah. that I thought was, there's, really kind of stealable ideas here, both in things that, thinking about things that you can quantify. And then you'll see what Melinda is doing is taking that quantification and turning it into a visualization. So that, that's, that's a really important step that if we can get our students to take numbers and turn it into a picture, the way that we can think about these things becomes different. Um, and while Melinda is looking that up, I'm going to really quickly just share a bit of research with you. Um, check this out, All right? This is um, from this article. Uh, we'll scroll up here. Do -do 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 -do. Oh, oh, there it was. The drawing effect. Evidence for reliable and robust memory benefits in free recall. So what this is looking at is the impact of drawing um, versus using words in remembering something. And um, the results of it are very, very interesting across a bunch of different experiments. Um, black is drawing writing is the clear, um, you, what you're seeing is higher recall for things where there was a drawing made. Mm -hmm. So the drawing is a really kind of powerful memory cue, but also the way that your brain works when you're using pictures is different than the way your brain works when you are using words. And so part of the strategy then is to be using both of these, right? It's not, so you don't want to, the take home from this is not that, oh, pictures are better than words, so you don't use words, right? Those are different things. If you're using pictures and words, you get a synergistic enhanced benefit from doing both of these things because those are engaging different parts of your brain. So this and. So what, what Melinda had on this electrical storm was that it was this really neat kind of also, um, she took her numbers and then she transformed that into a visualization. Um, let me stop my screen share. Are you ready, Melinda? Kind of, uh, hold on, you're muted. Um, I wanted to add that, uh, let's see, unmute myself. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Roger that. Okay, um, so I wanted to add, I know we're talking about taking measurements and using all these great tools, but I also want to have just throw in there that the, you, as a teacher, you can step back and say, I don't have to have all these tools because sometimes we don't have enough tools for students. So, you know, I come from a nature connection, nature awareness teaching focus. So we're going outside in nature and then allowing the children or students or adults 
to just take in nature without the burden of all of these, of all the equipment. Um, and I have a scientific training background, so I'm kind of blending both of those together. And so what I want to encourage you is if you don't have a wind meter, if you can't measure wind speed or wind direction, there's a lot of different ways that we used to measure those things without tools. So I want you to explore that and with your students just say, hmm, how can we measure the wind direction if I don't have a tool to do it? And, you know, you can use, um, so I did it with my next door neighbor has an American flag. And I, when I sit out front, I write down what the wind speed is based on what the flag is doing. So if the flag is slack, I'll just put slack and put a little icon. If it's like flapping a little bit one quarter, I just put a one quarter. So I know it's not scientific, right, in, in that sense of quantification. But I also know that for me personally, I get too bogged down with those kinds of numbers and then I miss the connection with nature. So my journey in nature journaling is to just really stop and take in the feeling of nature. So I'm trying to observe more qualitatively, but I think it works because sometimes we don't have the tools to do it. And if we teach our children how to measure things qualitatively, then they can measure anything. They don't have to have a special tool. They don't have to be at school. They can do it in their backyard. They could do it on vacation with their family, right? So um, I want you to just, you know, think about that too, um, that you don't have to have that tool, like wind speed. Um, there was a woman on our Sunday nature journaling club who went out and she had a wind chime hanging down. She, she's a sailor, she used to sail. So she tied a piece of ribbon on her wind chime. And when the wind blew, she drew a little legend. So when the, the string was down, it was slack. And when it was like 20 degrees, she called it light. And when it was about 45, she called it moderate. And when it went straight across, she said hi. So she's just making up those categories, but then she was able to, to jot down in a period of, I don't know what the time period it was, but like, oh, it's low, then it's medium, then it's high. And then she graphed it and showed this really cool graph. So you can do this kind of, of, of data collection without any fancy tools. So um, Arpin, I guess I was thinking about you Arpin because you're talking about wind speed, wind direction. Just use a string and hang it from, you know, a nail on your balcony or a ribbon and then see what happens, maybe something with a weight on it so it has a little bit more, more um, um, weight on it so that it swings and, and see what happens. You know, when it goes straight out to the left, you know, use a compass to figure out where is north or maybe not even a compass. You know, like Jack was saying, like you're learning in your body, like where does, where is north? Where does the sun come up? Where does the sun go down? You know, and you can, and you teach your students how to do this. So, um, so that was just, I just wanted to add that in there. Um, so with the lightning storm, it was nighttime. It was 1.15 in the morning and I didn't have any tools. And so I, I was just in awe watching the lightning storm. And what I noticed is that there were a lot of flashes and I wanted to record that in my journal. And the only thing I could think about is like, there's so many flashes. So I got the idea to time them um, because I wanted to add numbers. And so I took, actually I did have my phone and I have a time, I set the timer for 30 seconds and then I just kind of held it by my ear so it would chime when 30 seconds was over. And then, so I would, when the third, when it started, I would just count how many flashes. And so I recorded how many flashes per 30 seconds. So, um, where did I put it? Oh, okay, so it's down, down here. So this page was done in the dark. I turned on my phone every once in a while and I, jo I just drew some of the lightning, all my observations, and then I counted every 30 seconds and I just counted how many there were. So now this is data, data from the storm from my yard at a particular time. And the next day I went back and I, um, I, got a little nerdy and then I, I graphed it. So I put number of lightning strikes in 30 second intervals. And then this is how the frequency of how many, how many times that happened. So five lightning strikes in a 30 second interval only happened once, but six happened three times. And so then I can graph this and, and see the frequency of lightning flashes. Now, I didn't take all, if I took other measurements like Avea had, you know, maybe I can, you know, answer some really cool questions. But in the moment, that's what came to me is like, there are so many lightning flashes. I wanted to um, do something with that. 
And so this is one way that you can visualize data just in a bar graph. Um, another way is um, putting each point across the time scale down on the bottom. So this was the first interval, second interval to the last interval. And then this is the frequency of lightning strikes in that interval. And then I plotted it to see if maybe there's a pattern. Um, and then the other number I used was um, compass heading. So I knew some of my headings, um, so I pulled out a nature journal and looked at my headings for my garden because it's the same spot where I did my summer solstice um, sun tracker. And I was noticing that this is the um, horizontal extent of the storm when I first sat out there in the light blue. And then in the dark blue, it expanded in like the, the 15 minutes I, I was watching. And I sat there up for about an hour and um, later on it had expanded even further. So I, what I did is I looked at where the lightning was striking and I had my um, point of reference. It's like, oh, it's that telephone pole or, oh, it's that neighbor's house or it's that big pine tree. And then the next morning I went through and then I calculated what the compass directions were on my compass. But you know, even if I didn't have a compass, I could still say that the lightning, it, you know, storm expanded because it went from, you know, this area to another area. And then I also did the um, vertical extent of the storm. So the storm was really far away at first. And um, from Jack, I learned that you can estimate the, um, I think the degrees when you put, you put your outstretched arm and it will hold a fist. Yeah, and exactly. And I couldn't remember if the top of my fist needed to be at eye level or the bottom, but I figured, you know what, doesn't really matter. I'm going to estimate. This is the thing, like as a scientist, like I want to get the, ac the actual numbers, but this is taking work for me to just loosen up a little bit and just allow myself to just estimate because really the important thing is to notice, right? It, it's less for this activity, it's less important to get the actual accurate number from, from me. I just want to get the, the estimate. So then I estimated um, how high it was in the sky. So that's one way that you can use numbers. Um, I think that's it for the numbers. Yeah. Well, you and really then, see that storm just going poof. Yeah, yeah. And I wish I had stayed awake. You know, I went to sleep and then it went over the house and, and, and it went north of us. So it would have been really cool to collect more data to see like, then it's, then the um, horizontal expansion is on a different scale, right? Because it's north of me instead of south of me. So there's just so much to, um, you know, to look at and wonder. And, and like Jack is saying, if we don't have the, um, the tools, the toolkit, like the possible set of tools, like we're just listing right now, if we have that, then we have the possibility of measuring numbers in all kinds of things out in nature. That's, that's really wonderful. Um, just one more quick share before we wrap up. Some time ago in a previous educators workshop, I shared um, some possible back pages for a new nature journal that I was uh, developing and um, what kind of tools and quantification tools should I have in there. And I had this biometrics not a biometrics, but a um, Beaufort wind scale in there. And people were saying that this is too wordy. I want that to be pictures. And so I revised it um, and it has, um, um, and, 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 and there it is. Can you see the? That's great. So I, I'm, I'm getting. Oh, I like that. And starting to kind of get that, you know, what the, 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 those, the, those, those, those same sort of things that you're, that you're describing with the flags and that can be actually fed into the, the Beaufort scale. So if that's, that's just fun. So that will be in the next version of the nature journals that I produce that little uh, touch sheet will be one of the little, one of the things in the back. It'll be fun. So what we've done here is we have crowdsourced a bunch of nature journaling quantification strategies. Um, and what's neat about this is I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. And there's tons of stuff that came up here today that has been totally off my radar and I now have a bigger toolkit. And so what you want to do is look at this list and think about what things on here do you not usually do? Hmm. 
and just you know the idea of like you know the extent of the storm in those boxes and like, i don't know how you thought of that but now that that you've mentioned it i think like how could i repurpose that you know that's really really interesting and that's so i i think that's just delightful absolutely delightful so we've got more tools in our toolkit and what's going to happen is don't expect your students to like you know automatically think like you know well yes you can quantify you know you know, have all these different tools of quantification once we if you do some brainstorming like this with them they'll be able to come up with some on their own and if they do that they will remember those and then you can also add to their toolkit things that um you otherwise um that you otherwise uh they, they, may, they might not have mentioned um and the more we practice finding the numbers around us the world around us becomes a place filled with numbers and we get to see the beauty and the utility of those numbers so thank you folks so much for sharing these ideas with us today that was really fun